Good afternoon. You can all move up. There's plenty of space if you want. Um, thank you for making up to the session. My name is Azar Saeed. I am uh, one of the chief architects in Red Hat and the telco team. Uh, my job is to work with lots of service providers, understand their requirements, understand their deployment models, and I hope to share some experiences with you based on those deployment models today in this uh, multi-site open stack deployment options and challenges for telco. A quick disclaimer, I'm not a product manager, so don't ask me for roadmaps, please. Don't ask me for product support questions. Uh, they are owned by the product team. They are owned by the product managers. Um, what I do want to do, though, through this presentation is start a dialogue and start a conversation with all of you uh, in terms of what are those multi-site deployment options, what are the challenges, why do we need them, what are the use cases, and how do we actually you know, make things happen. Uh, so what we'll do is very quickly, we'll zoom in on the OpenStack you know, architecture very, very quickly just to identify some components that are critical to us in terms of multi-site deployment. Well, I'm not going to go into the details of OpenStack history or architecture or anything of that sort. Um, we'll talk about the telco deployment use case in quite a bit of depth. We'll look at a couple of different use cases, see why, where it's applicable, how does it work. Then we'll look at the distributed deployment models or options that are available to us. Uh, especially some of the newer projects that are going on, some code that's actually being committed now. It's also the code that's coming in the next release of uh, Pike. Um, then we'll look at what are some of the issues with those uh, options that are there, and we'll see if we can find a solution that's relevant in the context of what we do. How many of you, by the way, before I start, attended the Verizon session on micro CPE? I think it was also shown as part of the keynote. One. No, two, three, four, five, quite a few, that's good. So it was shown as part of the keynote, the micro CPE, and actually there was a session that described what they did inside that micro CPE. That's actually in a very interesting use case and we'll dive down into that particular use case here um, and see what, what did Verizon do, why did they do it, what were the options, and what, did, you know, what are some possibilities in terms of how we you know, do the deployment. We all know this picture, right? Everybody has seen this. It's on the OpenStack documentation. Um, pretty complex picture, but two things that, that are important for you to note. One is Keystone, right at the bottom, right here. Another one is Nova. Those are the two important components that we will actually see how they can address some of the multi-site deployment conversations. Of course, there's also storage, OpenStack block storage right here that connects into the AMQP with respect to the Keystone. So if you don't want to listen to the rest of the presentation, you've got the three hints that I gave you in my first opening sentence, AMQP, Keystone, Nova. Same picture, just redrawn it in a slightly different way to look at it against the same three important points to focus on in terms of all of their connectivity and the models. Now let's look at the use case a little bit. Let's understand why do we need to deploy a really multi-site open stack? What are those use cases? Of course, no telco operates on a single data center. If there is a telco that operates on a single data center, I would like to meet that telco. Every telco has multiple data centers. Primary backup, two, three, four, one in each region. Some, some have tens, some have hundreds, some have even thousand. Now, especially with some of the architectures that are going around like virtualized central office, where every central office is kind of becoming a data center, you will actually, how many central offices are there in the US? More than 10,000. You wanna have 10,000 data centers, each data center with an OpenStack install? Awesome, how are you gonna manage that many? That's an interesting question. Mobile edge compute. Um, a lot of telcos, mobile providers are deploying compute much closer to the user. Why are they doing it? Because they need that compute power to deal with latency and round trip times so that they can process it locally and transmit it back. Virtual reality, um, smart car or self-driven or self -driven cars, those are the, they impose a set of requirements in terms of the amount of compute that needs to be available as close as possible to the consumer or to the user in the, in the IoT context as well as in this uh, entire mobile edge. Virtualized RAN, virtualized CRAN, VRAN, many, many people use different names for it. Again, the idea is to actually remove the active components from antenna locations and put them into a compute location that's virtualized and much closer to those antenna locations using some sort of a front hall for a mobile carrier 
to, so that you can actually process that information right there, make those antennas passive elements that can be reprogrammed and redirected based on software. Um, of IoT gateways and fog computing model. Um, I mean, Cisco has been pushing around this fog computing model for a little while in terms of, again, trying to put those compute capabilities much, much closer to the data acquisition points for sensors so that you can provide information or um, much faster decisions based on the data that you've acquired back to those endpoints that can then process it and actually act accordingly. So again, speed is of essence. Latency is of essence. That's why you need those compute, you know, sitting in those remote sites. Of course, everybody knows the collapsed branch application that's been sitting around, the collapsed branch, branch deployment models that has been around for a very long time, where you have multiple sets of different capabilities within a branch that are all being collapsed due to the power of virtualization into some number of virtual functions that sit on standard hardware or standard servers and you know they, they can be virtualized and they can be managed remotely. So all of those requirements push the telcos into looking at options in terms of deploying compute capability much, much closer to the edge of their network or, to the, or closer to the consumer. When you deploy compute capability much, much closer to the edge of the network and closer to the consumer, the challenge you will have is how are you going to manage those compute nodes how are you going to instantiate those compute nodes? How are you going to you know, um, orchestrate those compute nodes? So going back, just illustrating that in a big picture environment, you have all these remote sites, you have multiple data centers that sit out there. Each one runs an OpenStack instance. You may have a hierarchical connectivity model that doesn't mean anything. Each one is an independent island. Each one actually manages its own local sets of resources. And every telco has this particular deployment model today. In fact, most people, if you ask them, how are you deploying OpenStack, that's how they say they do it. H1 is a separate instance. The HA functionality and or the service functionality that they bring to the table through these multiple deployments is not at an infrastructure layer, but it's at, a, at the VNF layer or at the network applications layer. In, in that particular context. So this is a standard deployment model that you, have, you typically see every single, but the thing is that service always spans across multiple data centers. What does that mean? Suppose I'm a residential customer to my service provider or I'm a business customer to my service provider. Some functions may be hosted in one data center, other functions may be hosted in other data centers. What the service provider really has to do is stitch that functionality together to provide that overall service for me which means the service provider is actually looking at those multiple different entities of OpenStack deployment as a separate zone or a separate model. Service provider has to ensure that the policies are appropriate, the authentication models are appropriate, and that when you go provision a service, when you have to provision some VMs in one data center, another set of VMs in another data center, and then do the network stitching across them, you know, that needs to be really done in order to really offer a typical service for me as a user, as a consumer. So that's not as easy as it sounds. Well, OpenStack is great at deploying a single data center. OpenStack can manage a whole bunch of resources in a single data center, whether it's Neutron, whether it's, you know, Nova, whether it's Glance, Cinder, whatever. Within the limits, within that operational boundary within that administration domain, it's very, very good at operating that. It's very, very good at controlling that. It's very, very good at providing those set of resources to you on demand. You can do elasticity. You can do all of that. Now you have to actually go to each location, pick a template, do the deployment model, worry about auto scale in a different way on those different contexts, and then actually deliver the service. So you need some, some level of service orchestration over and above this OpenStack Island deployment. Let's take a real case. This is a real case, by the way. I have hidden the name of the service provider. This particular service provider came to us and said, well, we have you know, 25 locations. Not too many, not hundreds, not thousands, only 25 locations. We really need two to five VNFs in each one of those locations to provide services. Two to five VNFs can easily be hosted in one or two compute blades, maximum. Now, you want a redundant model, two compute nodes per site, 
25 sites, you get to 50 compute nodes total. 50 compute nodes total for a large telco is a you know, two rack, three rack deployment in one site, simple. But here, it's a distributed model, right? You have these 25 locations, it has to be closer to the user. If you want to deploy a redundant configuration, the minimum redundant configuration supported model is what? Three controllers. So you're burning three controllers for two compute nodes, or maybe even one compute node per site. What's your overhead? You total, if you just do a simple math, you, do, you have 75 storage nodes, you have 75 control nodes, but you have 50 compute nodes that are sitting there. That doesn't make any economical sense. It, why should I go deploy OpenStack in this particular situation? I'm going to try to find something else. And what is that something else? I don't know the answer to that, what, what that something else is. But it's an interesting problem, and this is a real problem. It's a real service provider with real number of sites, with a real requirement that came to us and said, help us. How are we going to do this? So you have literally 75% overhead in terms of compute power that's going there into controllers, into storage nodes for initializing three VNFs, literally, per site. Here's another uh, example. Take a telco that has about 1,000 central offices. You want to go CORD. Anybody heard of the word CORD, C-O-R-D, central office redirected as data center? A few. Good. So what, what that architecture is all about, it's all about creating or building that central office like you would build a data center with a fabric, with compute nodes, with controller nodes, with you know, VNFs that are hosted there, with appropriate service chaining, orchestration, and so on. And oh, by the way, for those of you who know Cord, we are also interested in building a Cord-like architecture with ODL instead of Onus controller and so on, but that's a separate topic. Regardless, whether you adopt the VCO architecture that's being discussed in the ODL working group, or whether you adopt the Cord architecture as defined by Linux Foundation and OnLab, you still have to deploy OpenStack. When you deploy OpenStack, you have a 1,000 central offices. Each central office, now you're going to go deploy full OpenStack. How many sub subs a central office may serve depends on where that central office is located. If the central office is in Boston City, then you're, then you're serving probably lots of customers, no issues. If your central office is in rural, rural Pennsylvania, well, no, it's serving a bunch of hundreds of houses. That's about it. So do you then go and deploy the same model do you put the entire keystone? Do you put the entire authentication models on those sites? Do you, what do you do? That's a real, again, a real challenge and a real um, the, you know, question. Now, if you ask Verizon, what did they do in their micro CPE? What they did, they put actually the entire open stack on the micro CPE. I, I didn't get a chance to ask the question, but if anybody from Verizon is in the audience, maybe they can answer my question is what's the compute power you put on that particular micro CPE? I know they containerized it. I know they'd made it lightweight. I know they made it run, but it's, it runs the full OpenStack suite. Now, what telcos have done, and I did ask the question to, to the presentation after the presentation was done, uh, is how do you create, how do you manage the authentication model in such a, such a situation where you have thousands of those micro CPEs that are scattered around in your network. Well, they said, look, we, we don't do that. We don't worry about trying to you know, build a common central authentication model in this particular case. We use TACAX from, from a user's perspective to actually manage that, and we still let the standard keystone templates you know, res reside and users reside and authenticate the local resources on the micro CPE. The advantage that it gives them is nobody can muck around with the local, you know, interfere with local containers that are sitting on that particular micro CPE. Okay, that's fine. Is that an option for everybody? I don't know. Now let's go look into those deployment options and models. And I kind of described them a little bit for you before I got into the slide. Multiple independent island model. We've seen that. It's being done today. That's how people are doing it today, in fact. Common authentication model, I kind of hinted that a bit. We'll actually dig down a little bit more into this common authentication model. Then we'll also dig down into the stretch deployment model. What does that stretch deployment model mean? Can we peel off nodes functionality from a single open stack and then start to go deploy them in different places? That's what we'll go. We'll look into it a little bit more in detail. Then um, another model maybe, while I still want independent open stack islands, Maybe what I need is 
availability of resources to be able to orchestrate within those OpenStack islands. So that's what kind of TriCircle tries to do, and we'll actually dig into TriCircle also a little bit, what that TriCircle approach is. Proxying some of the APIs, creating an API gateway model, those are the things that we need to look at, and this is the work that's happening in the OpenStack you know, projects or, or groups these days. Um, maybe we'll look at a complete agent-based model. I don't know what that will look like. I have an idea in my head, uh, but I want, to, I want to be able to code it before I come back to you and say this idea works. And of course, is there anything else, any other wild, wild ideas? I don't know. There was a very interesting presentation that was done, I think, yesterday or today. I don't remember. Now I'm drawing a blank because I, I did one presentation on Tuesday, and this is my second one, so everything's lost in between. Uh, about something called Kubernetes Sandwich. Um, we'll, we'll take a look at that Kubernetes Sandwich as well. So in the first one, you have multiple different, and this is, by the way, what is being done by most people, is you go deploy OpenStack in different locations. You put some sort of a load balancer in front of them. You authenticate your users through the directory, through LDAP, right, or through TACAX or through some other means, outside, out of band, nothing to do with the OpenStack environment. You authenticate the user through that. And then when, once you hit the load balancer, the load balancer is the one that's responsible for you to push your request to A or B, depending on how you've d divided. Of course, within OpenStack, too, you already have those capabilities of regions and projects and all of that, right? But here, this is like, you know, you're masking some of the deployment capabilities behind, you know, uh, some load balancers, and you're m making for the user, the u it, things become transparent. Of course, when you have a load balancer type of model, then everything in one OpenStack instance or one data center has to be identical to another data center because only then the load balancer situation will work. If you want specific workloads in a specific locations, obviously that's not going to be helpful for you to put a load balancer in front, right? Then you want, a, you want to go to a specific instance, go configure that, pick a project, pick a template, pick, go deploy, go to do your heat deployment, you know, uh, hot temp uh, deployment models and, and, and so on. Um, disaster recovery is an external problem. It's, it's a, probably an application issue. It's not an infrastructure issue. So then you actually use some of the disaster recovery tools to be able to actually recover data from one data center to another. Now, in each of those data centers, you have a fully redundant configuration with three controllers, three storage nodes. By the way, I use 3.3 a lot because 3 is kind of the minimal HA deployment. You need an odd number of controllers, so 2N plus 1, right, in terms of... Uh, any, um, to, to create a quorum and to ensure that HA operates appropriately. So we use a three controller model here. You know, each, each um, data center has to have those three controllers. You roll, roll with the idea. The next one is to actually have a common keystone. This is an interesting model, and this is of interest to actually a lot of people, which is you, act, you pull the keystone out or you point to a central keystone. This is sometimes referred to as shared keystone or distributed, you know. You, you, in, other, in other cases, in the previous case, it was a distributed keystone, common backend integration, right? So keystone integrates with LDAP in terms of the authentication capabilities. You have one central keystone to, to point to, and you take all of those remote locations and point back to the keystone. In keystone, each, each, again, region or each area is a fully redundant system. It's independent, except that the keystone is common. So what you do in keystone is there is something in keystone services. There are, you know, keystone services has tables associated with each of those capabilities, Nova, Neutron, and so on, right? In that, there is something called an endpoint table. Uh, you can actually, if you have access to your OpenStack, you can actually do it. check that. There's something called an endpoint table. In the endpoint table, you define the following. You, endpo you define the endpoint type, you define the service, you define a region, and you define an IP address. So what you do is you actually go modify that endpoint service table, right, endpoint table, to point to the same keystone in each one of those locations. So it's a manual hack, but it works to create a central model, and if somebody wants a key centralized keystone, that's how they do it. Now, the advantage of having a centralized keystone is the I, the ability to have one central location for all of the authentication models, right? For all of the users, resources, and so on. And then the rest of them can still continue to operate in the same way for those distributed uh, OpenStack instances. Now, 
you can still have a central controller, but this is another common requirement that we get, which is how about if I just do storage and compute in those different remote locations? Like HCI, right? Hyperconverged infrastructure. I have controllers in one site, and then on another site, I put storage in, I put compute in, and I have a hyperconverged infrastructure there, and now I'm going to operate that remote site as if it was part of my master site with the same set of controllers. This is doable. This works if you want to do it today. The key question is, how far can you put that remote site? The key question is, how much workload that crosses the WAN boundary between those two sites? And that's what we'll dig into a little bit later on during the presentation. Um, in this particular model, when you have this remote hyperconverged clusters or hyperconverged nodes, um, you can potentially replicate some of the databases and some of the storage capabilities across from one site to another, and you can do a manual restore later on. So it's, it's almost like that's a stub site. It just doesn't have full control of everything. You've replicated some information. You're pointing it to it locally on that remote site for faster access, and you're doing some RBD mirroring or some synchronization across from the master to the, to the stub site. So this is like a stretch deployment model for storage and compute, but it is limited to the number of few sites. Obviously, you can't take this model and say, I'm going to deploy this across 1,000 sites, or 500 sites, or even 100 sites, or even 20 sites. Right? It becomes really complicated. Two sites, five sites, maybe you can. Okay. <clears throat> now let's revisit that thick, thick CPE branch office use case. I, showed you a little picture when, about those telco use cases, and I said, here is you know, a deployment model of converged branch, where you're converging a whole bunch of functionality onto a couple of servers, one, two, three, whatever those servers are. If you start to do that and start to deploy these type of servers on those branch offices, there is a deployment model that, that, comes, that people have coined called thick CPE. Thick, the reason why they call it thick CPE is instead of putting a router, a firewall, a, a switch, and something else, they put a server there. Take those functions, virtualize them, run it on that server, and that server has a vRouter, a virtual router function, that actually tunnels traffic back into the data center where you do the traffic manipulation and provide the rest of the services. Now, that again is an interesting requirement in terms of a thick CPE, but if you have, you know, how many customers do you have as a telco? 1,000, 2,000, 10,000, 5,000, num lots of numbers. Each customer has how many sites? An average customer has, what, five to eight sites. How many are we looking? 35,000 sites, 50,000 sites? Now you start putting servers in all of those sites, 30,000 sites, 20,000 sites, and you want to actually put Nova, you know, you want to put compute there. You're going to be able, you need to be able to manage that compute, that bare metal in some way. Can you start to put OpenStack? That's exactly what micro CPE is for Verizon. It is that three VNFs. If you, so if you remember the picture of Verizon, you'd have three VNFs, full open stack, in, embedded in that particular box that they showed up on the keynote. It's thousands of sites that you have to go and deploy that. Is it going to work? <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, one may say, well, why can't I look at the um, flexibility that was provided to me since OSP 10 in terms of splitting some functionality on the controllers and then trying to put those functionality in an appropriate way that I can actually architect my infrastructure, architect my OpenStack capability to actually dis distribute them. So OSP 10 allows you to actually do what is called as um, composable roles. So you can build controllers with certain set of capabilities. What it has done is you've actually split that into pacemaker and system D level of functionality, and you can actually split those across and create custom roles for controllers. What this custom roles allows you, this has been available since OSP 10, by the way, there are some more enhancements that came in, in, in 11 as well. <clears throat> so those, by doing that, you can actually separate Keystone out. You can separate potentially Solometer out. You can separate Neutron out. 
you can separate you know, RabbitMQ out. Why am I talking about separating these components out? These are the components that we will need to play around with in order to actually build a multi-site OSP infrastructure. And those are the components that potentially have some bottlenecks in them that we will actually need to, need to tune. So then going back to the central site, you could do the same thing. You could create a hierarchical model. You could create a hierarchical model by separating those components out, placing them appropriately in your infrastructure. Now, looking at this picture, picture this, is, you know, this in no way represents a real service provider. I did have a real service provider network uh, from LATAM. They had 220 locations in which they wanted to put OpenStack. 220, and then they had about 18 top-level locations where it was full service, and then they had about 1,000 plus lower-level locations where they would have compute elements. And they really were after us to say, hey, Red Hat, can you help us get to this particular deployment model? We, we've tested it, it works, it seemed to work, when we can put remote compute nodes out there with this. And we had a very long conversation with them going back and forth to understand what's the deployment model, how are they doing it, why are they doing it. Um, but it creates an interesting, so what they wanted to do was have that flexibility to say, I'm gonna go deploy a controller capability here, you know, and then manage this region, because some of them sit in a fiber path. If, if there is a big fiber loop, I'm gonna put a controller here, and all those nodes that are sitting in that particular big, big fiber, all those central offices that are sitting in the big fiber loop, they can be just all compute extensions instead of putting multiple open stacks in each, each one of them. It's a real deployment, it's a real question, it's a real challenge. So what are some considerations then in that case? What do we need to look at? Now, as we started talking to these service providers, as we started to have these con detailed conversations, some things became obvious. One w that was obvious was, what's the latency between those sites? From where you put the compute to where you put the controllers. What's the latency? What's the round trip time delay that you can expect on an average? I was talking to one of the global providers they had a location in France, and then they had another location in Miami, and they wanted to actually put some compute locations in Miami and manage it from France with all of the controllers. Well, this transcontinental link, this latency challenge, um, what, is, what is it that the maximum that you can get? And not only it's just the latency of that particular link, but it's also what's the outage time. What's, what happens when the node disappears, when the link disappears, the node is still running, the controller thinks the node is down. Controller's trying to rescale, and the link comes back up. How do you deal with that particular? So it's not just saying my latency is within this boundary and I can manage it and I can probably tune the conf file to say expect half a second delay. Expect you know two seconds delay. That's probably a lot easier if that's the case, if it's, and if it's always consistent. But if it's not consistent and, if it, when, and you have an outage, you come back up, what happens? So you need that headless operational model and recovery option, right, for that. Also, when you have a link that fails and maybe there are 10 sites hiding behind that particular link, now the link comes back up, you have 10 sites that suddenly come back up, awake and say, I'm here. So you, it causes another thing called startup storm. These are common issues you find in telcos we are not visiting or we are not getting these issues because what we focus on always is deploying OpenStack in a data center managing compute infrastructure that's local. Suddenly now you want to take the same OpenStack that, that's managing compute infrastructure that's local and start to try to do all these kind of type of funky things. Everybody throws up their hands and says, ah, no, it doesn't work. Okay, um, where does the other bottleneck show up? The other bottleneck shows up in Oslo messaging. I know that there's been lo this has been a source of a lot of pain for people just scaling OpenStack within a data center in terms of scaling message queues. Understanding Oslo messaging, understanding you know, the RabbitMQ. Um, why? Because things like Solometer, of course with you know, Aird and uh, Ganache, are the biggest consumers of RabbitMQ. Solometer is the biggest consumer of RabbitMQ. Also, Nova uses RabbitMQ to provision 
to make changes. Nova uses the same RabbitMQ. Now what happens? You have a remote site. You have salometer message, you know, information, agents collecting information and sending it back to the collector. And you also are trying to make changes to the Nova API or to the, to the compute information. And now you have latency and you have round trip time issues. That's what creates the biggest challenge. Now, one of the conversations we ended up having with, with um, at least two different providers here is to come up with a latency bound and say, um, what is my latency boundary? Can I test within that boundary and say, yes, this works, hence go ahead and deploy within that boundary? So what is that round trip time? Based on that round trip time, you can adjust the RabbitMQ queues. So there's something called a bandwidth delay product, BDP. It's a standard um, you know, thing, BDP, in uh, uh, when, you, when you do any, any kind of queue tuning for or buffer tuning for routers, for switches, and, and for people who have deployed WANs, this is a standard term that they come up with. This is bottleneck speed, uh, link speed times the uh, round trip time. So you do, do that. What is the outage time? You do the queue tuning through that. And, and when, when you have problems with it, you, have, you, can, you can have things like Nova flap, neutron timeouts, um, you know, headless operation recovery and restart storm. So, so what you do is you do bandwidth delay product-based tuning in terms of buffer sizes. You look at the number of messages that you're passing in the system from those remote nodes. One of the conversations is why don't you split the message queues. So if you split the message queues into a message queue that handles Salometer agents, a message queue that handles Nova, a message queue that handles Neutron, perhaps then you can apply some external QoS to actually you know, tune the in environment. It's complicated, it's not easy, but it is possible. There was actually a very interesting presentation done in OpenStack Austin, and there's a video available online in terms of splitting message queues and what the performance gain was for those by splitting those message queues. Even inside a single data center, forget about the wide area deployment. Uh, take a look at that pres presentation. It was actually quite impressive. Now, recently, there have been some AMQP enhancements that were done. In the AMQP enhancements, what happens is in the new enhancements, you eliminate the broker model where each time a message needs to go to a broker, you have a tree-like structure, and the message travels from broker to broker and out to the, to the actual agent. So what you do is, instead of that, you create this mesh router model that allows you to actually pass messages directly and route those messages to the endpoints. If you have to go between you know, exchanges or between domains, then you can actually potentially use a broker to go between domains. But otherwise, you can send a message directly to the message router, and it, it gets delivered directly to the endpoint without having to go through a broker latency, requeuing, and so on. So these are some new enhancements that was done. This is a new driver that's available in Newton, I believe, for AMQP, for Oslo messaging. Should consider, if you must use RabbitMQ, then tune the hell out of RabbitMQ. Use exchanges, use shovel plugins, split those into multiple, and try to scale this as, as large as possible. The, uh, here's another interesting project called OpenStack Cascading Project. This is another option. This was actually submitted, I think, a few years ago. Um, there was an interesting presentation done on OpenStack Cascading Project. The idea was to actually create a set of proxy APIs at the central site that corresponded to each remote site. So what you see here in yellow there on top is this is a set of proxies for this site. And this is a full OpenStack deployment, and you see the control functions that are listed out here. Similarly, this set is for this site. And likewise, you'll have one set for each site that you deploy full OpenStack on. This is called the cascaded node or region. This is called the cascading region. You can create an interesting hierarchy with a parent-child relationship with that. Subsequently, since then, this was obviously quite complicated. Um, so since then, they've actually split that into two different projects called TriCircle and Trio Tool. Um, TriCircle is the ability to extend the network from one OpenStack site into the other OpenStack site. So you can stre create stretched Galera clusters, for example. 
or you can create stretched you know, um, networking. So in other words, from one data center, you can provision resources over into the other data center right here, from one to the other, and you can create this new, through Neutron, through Neutron API and Neutron extensions, you can actually go provision workloads in the other data center. So that's what TriCircle is. And in fact, Verizon team actually stated that as part of their presentation, that they're very much interested in TriCircle to be able to allow to manage these remote micro CPEs. Then the other portion, so this is all on Neutron from a TriCircle perspective, um, is to create the API gateway. So instead of creating a proxy API set for every site, you have a common API gateway. And in that common API gateway, you actually, that position that in front of the user as your central management page or central location, and that in turn then goes and provisions down into each data center that's modeled as an availability, availability zone. So now you can create AZ1 through AZN. You can treat each AZ availability zone as a pod, and the way you do it is this API gateway, what it does is it creates this unique ID with a tenant ID and a pod ID. So because these parts, you know, there are some finite number of parts and that are, that are unique, you have finite number of tenants that are unique, you can now create a unique ID to go provision any given workload through this particular API gateway into any one of these OpenStack regions. So an interesting way of dealing with this. Still, I don't know, for example, how far this will scale to that thick CPE model that we just discussed. So what is the alternative? We are almost getting to the end of our presentation. So what is the alternative? Well, the thick CPE model was the all-in-one OpenStack model. Now the question is, should we abandon the idea of OpenStack on those remote nodes? If you have to run one, two VNFs, do you really want to do that? Maybe we can do some hypervisor, some workloads, take that and you know, do some level of automation outside OpenStack and actually go deploy them. That might be an option for that thick CPE model. It might not be an option if you want full-fledged data centers but still want to be able to extend those compute nodes across. Uh, use Kubernetes. Kubernetes to, as a master orchestrator for those remote sites. For, I mean, as a master orchestrator that then goes and provisions OpenStack, which then goes and provisions workloads uh, further, whether they are VMs or even containers. And this is where the word container sandwich comes into picture, which is, you have Kubernetes sandwich, which is you have Kubernetes as a master orchestrator installing OpenStack control services, which then you know, create the compute on which you install further either containers or VMs. And that's an interesting concept, interesting conversation. Um, just in the next room over, Robert Starmer was actually talking about exactly that particular topic. Um, so this, this is what it is, which is to take those control services run them as containers in those remote nodes and then manage those capabilities across um, and use Kubernetes as a ma master orchestrator to drive that particular uh, conversation. So just summary, uh, in summary today, a lot of people are deploying independent OpenStack islands. They, it is tough for them to manage all of those islands together. They are trying to look at external tools such as cloud management platforms to make that happen. TriCircle and Trio 2.0 is of significant interest to multiple people. They offer a good promise. This is where I need your help, your input, your feedback, because this is where we are working in to see whether that really addresses the problem or do we need to fundamentally look at a different way where we have you know, a, some sort of an agent that sits out on the remote side and actually uh, helps us manage that, maybe just in plain Kubernetes um, environment. Crafting that availability zone model within the bounds of how many different data centers that you have to create that will definitely help. The Nova Agent Proxy, which we just saw in terms of the Trio 2.0, um, that's useful. Perhaps we can just partition Nova Agent out of that particular API gateway and look at it differently. Um, deploying bare metal at remote sites, then how do you actually just power on those bare metal? How do you actually make that happen? Not an option. You probably need to ship those remote sites with some image that boots and then, then call, does a call back home to be able to uh, make it happen. But if you want to go the Verizon route, then yes, you have an option to do a full open stack there. Um, and then I briefly spoke about this Kubernetes sandwich, um, which is of interest to a lot of people where you're running 
Kubernetes as a master orchestrator, running OpenStack contain, uh, you know, control services containers, which in turn then deploy Nova, and then you use those compute to go deploy further workloads in. Um, no good answer, unfortunately. There's a lot of work that's happening in the Trio 2 space. Um, there's a lot of work that we are involved in. We'd be happy to work if anybody is interested here to, uh, in this particular context and happy to learn more from you in terms of how you're deploying it or how you're solving that particular problem. That's about it. Thank you very much. One or two questions, please, and then we'll wrap it up because I think we're out of time. T take two questions, one here, one here. Yeah. Adam Young, uh, Keystone Core. So, of course, I want to know what features or what uh, enhancements would you like to see from Keystone to better support multi-site? Thank you, Adam. Uh, uh, so, Adam, if you don't know, actually, works in the next aisle over in the same company, so he's also from Red Hat. So uh, thank you for asking that question. That's an important question in terms of what you want to see. What, 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 You're what, welcome. What I would want to see from Keystone is the ability to really handle thousands of sites from, so from a scale perspective. Um, these different requirements with respect to compute, storage, um, and uh, you know, the ability to manage those at a, at a, at a central site. So when you say that um, there's a consistency issue, right, with the assignment database, even if you use federation for the user yes. and groups, um, you have to have somebody in charge of doing um, assignments and uh, propagating that information around. How, how would you like to see that work, even if it's in kind of general terms? Uh. Perhaps a longer conversation, but, but uh, <laughs> uh, we, we can discuss that. I think that the UID approach is actually an interesting one um, in terms of what's being discussed in Trio 2 But we, we, we can talk offline. Yes. So this is a slightly open-ended question. Uh, there is a model by which when two entities are disconnected, you can have one entity, instead of declaring failure, uh, expect that the other entity can come back up. And sure. the other entity can buffer any state changes, and when they get reconnected, sure. the buffer state can be up. Is any of that, you know, I know it's a harder problem to solve, buffering is needed, it's much more of a research topic, but any of that thought process going on in the um, community? That, so yes, it is a harder problem to solve, and we, we don't have answers to that problem, because one of the things that NOVA does ex extremely well is, when you know that there is a node that's down, then you can auto-orchestrate or sort of kick off a new one. So what should you do? The, the decision is what should you, should you shut down that process, wait for it to recover? Should you make that timeout long enough so that then you can actually recover state this way? Or should you say, no, something else happened, maybe the machine died, not the link, so I'm gonna try to put a new node in that location. Do you have a sense it, it, which way telcos are leaning? I mean, are they saying, declare failure, I'll stand up another VNN? That's, that's, what, they, they're that's what they're doing, exactly right. Because they want to be able to get the service back up as quickly as possible. Okay. All right. Thanks. All right, thank you very much. I'm sorry we don't, we're out of time.